Hello everyone, welcome to the KZGN News. Today we'll bring you news about the Supreme Court hearing a case against Obama executive orders, news about a potential 51st state, a proposed new California gun law, presidential campaign news, city council news, today's gas prices, weather, sports, and so much more. From the Rademacher Hills to Bee Mountain and the mighty Sierras, Ridgecrest to Inyo Kern and China Lake, this is your news for the Indian Wells Valley with the KZGN News Crew. Hello, I'm Tom Wednick. Thanks for joining us for the news affecting Ridgecrest in the Indian Wells Valley. Well, once again, we had a good rainfall yesterday. The rain resulted in the usual areas of road flooding around the city. The police department reminds everyone to slow down in flooded areas. So it looks like this El Nino winter is coming to be a reality. We had about another tenth of an inch of rain yesterday. I'll bet we're headed for a real beautiful, flowered spring this year. In news on court action concerning the courts blocking President Obama's executive orders, changing enforcement on illegal immigrants, the Supreme Court Monday decided to rule on President Barack Obama's decision to defer deportation for as many as 5 million illegal immigrants. They're agreeing to hear the administration's appeal on one of the most contentious issues of his presidency. The court will hear arguments in April setting up a likely late June ruling that will stoke what is already a fiery immigration debate in the presidential campaign. A federal appeals court said Obama overstepped his authority in ordering the plan, which would let millions of immigrants apply for a reprieve from deportation and get work permits. The program, announced in November 2014, but yet to take effect, is being challenged by Texas and 25 other states, almost all led by Republicans. In seeking Supreme Court review, Obama's legal team said the appeals court's unprecedented and momentous decision would strip the president of long-standing powers and give states an unwarranted right to challenge federal immigration policies in court. The Court of Appeals judgment enjoins nationwide a federal policy of great importance to federal law enforcement, to many states, and to millions of families with long-standing and close connections with this country. U.S. Solicitor General Donald Varelli argued in the appeal. Obama acted on his own to address the status of some of the country's 11 million illegal immigrants after Congress reached a stalemate in efforts to pass a comprehensive overhaul of immigration laws. Under the President's executive order, people whose children are either U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents and who meet other requirements could get relief from deportation for three years. Those individuals, who are primarily from Mexico and Central America, wouldn't be given an easier path to citizenship. The President says the program is simply a broader exercise of his accepted power to set priorities in deciding who should be deported. Republicans in Congress, and many of those running for President, say Obama's executive actions amount to unfair amnesty for people who broke the law to enter or remain in the country. In March 2015, Hardline Party members threatened to shut down Homeland Security Department unless Congress blocked Obama's plan. Immigration is a top issue in the 2016 presidential campaign and may influence the political loyalties of Hispanics, a fast-growing ethnic group. In challenging Obama's orders, Texas and its allies say federal immigration laws set out detailed rules for deportation and say nothing about giving the president authority to shield such a large category of people. Well, have you heard about a potential 51st state yet? There's a movement in Northern California for some counties there to form the 51st state. The name of the state would be Jefferson. Well, the movement was hit with a minor setback this week. The Sierra County Board of Supervisors voted 3-2 to two in favor of sticking with California. The supervisors addressed both sides of the issue. They affirmed that the northern counties of the state do face issues that could benefit from some extra attention by those in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. The board also brought up the proponents of Jefferson's failure to address how the current issues facing the northern counties would be assuaged with the formation of a new state. Assuming Congress and the California legislature allowed Jefferson to form in the first place, another strike against the movement was unverifiable petition signatures, a big deal as Sierra County is home to only 3,000 people. In the resolution declining to join the state of Jefferson, the board acknowledged the other side of the coin, saying there is a benefit in sharing a state government with our suburban and urban counterparts, as the state is the eighth largest economy in the world. 
Around the rest of Northern California, there are mixed feelings among the 23 targeted counties supporting the state of Jefferson. By our count, six counties have approved joining the state of Jefferson. Two more are holding votes in June. Four counties have rejected votes or proposals. Nine counties have taken no action whatsoever. Amador County is doing final evaluation of a possible ballot measure. And Lake County recently rescinded a March 2015 ordinance to place an advisory measure on the ba November ballot. So we'll just have to watch how this plays out. In news about new proposed gun laws in California, a new law has been proposed limiting rifle and shotgun purchases to only one per month. Currently, there is no limit on how many rifles or shotguns a person can buy. California already has a limit on one handgun per month. The bill was submitted by California State Assemblyman Miguel Santiago of Los Angeles. This bill would make the 30-day prohibition and the dealer delivery prohibition described above, applicable to all types of firearms. Additionally, another major law change is that the bill would delete the private party transaction exemption to the 30-day prohibition. Right now, people can purchase any amount of handguns via a private party transfer. That is when a private person arranges to sell their own gun to another private party. The California law requires those PPT sales to be transferred via a licensed firearms dealer right now. This is so a background check is done on the buyer before they take ownership of the gun. This new proposed law will limit PPT sales to one per month for all firearms. So new laws are coming again. I would expect we'll be seeing more attempts in the new year to limit more firearm sales. There is talk about another assault weapon ban as well. But the language of the new assault weapon law will likely take control of a lot of guns not previously considered an assault rifle. The new definition of an assault weapon will be changed to include many guns that bear no resemblance to an assault weapon. So the attack against guns will surely heat up this election year. Well, in another year of major business closings down stores and laying off employees by the thousands, we get news that Southern California Edison will also be cutting costs by shutting down some of its satellite payment centers. The Ridgecrest Payment Center will be one of those closed. They cite that most people are now using online payment methods, and the need for the manned payment center is no longer needed. The notice did include that there would, could still be a couple payment centers located here via a couple retail stores capable to make payments for us. They didn't provide the actual date of the closure yet, as there is a period that we can protest the decision to the PUC. The California PUC can be reached at one 800 649 7570. I can say I for one am against the closure. Every time I go there to make payments, the fine staff there are always helping someone with power related questions. SC is also taking a voice survey via their hotline. They ask two simple questions, then you can provide a voice comment. You can make comment there. Call 1 888 367 7178. I've called both lines. Now stay with us, for after the break, we'll talk about the Republican presidential campaign. Thanks for staying with us. In news from the Republican presidential campaign, we get this story from Iowa. Donald Trump is brandishing the endorsement of conservative Republican firebrand Sarah Palin in the increasingly intense 2016 GOP presidential campaign, giving the billionaire businessman a boost against Senator Ted Cruz from Texas less than two weeks before Iowa's kickoff caucuses. Media heads are spinning. The former vice presidential candidate said after taking the stage at a Trump rally Tuesday at Iowa State University, this is going to be so much fun, Palin, the former governor of Alaska and 2008 GOP vice presidential nominee. Palin said that with Trump as president, America would no longer apologize. No more pussyfooting around, Palin said. This follows the senator from South Carolina giving his endorsement to Cruz last week, just before the last Republican debate. This is important as Palin is generally seen as a top representative of the Tea Party movement and Cruz was supposed to get their endorsement. But no one has gotten the Tea Party endorsement yet. In the Democrat campaign, it seems the FBI is again expanding their investigation into Hillary Clinton. 
Apparently, there are some even higher security email violations that have been discovered. Reports state that there is even a higher level of security above the top secret level. These levels of security messages include information that only a small segment of the highest level of government officials have access to. It's reported that some of the emails from her server included these as well. If true, this is the highest level security breach a government employee can do. And also coming this year is the 2016 Summer Olympics. They will start up during the presidential campaigns. The Olympics will be held in Rio de Janeiro starting in August. More than 200 countries and 11,000 athletes will be competing. The games will last 17 days. In City Council news, which we haven't had in a while, the Council will meet for their first meeting tonight. The Council will discuss probably the most important item on the agenda. They will be considering the proposed Draft Joint Powers Authority Agreement for the Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency. This is the formal agreement between the City and other members of the new agency. This is an important item. This agreement establishes all the rules and powers of the new agency. If you have any interest in the city's role in the new groundwater sustainability agency, this is an important step. You still have time to make it to the meeting tonight. The meeting starts at 6 p.m. and this topic will probably come up around 6.30. And now here's an amazing story about a mayor in Virginia being chased by the county sheriff. This took place in Portsmouth, Virginia. Mayor Kenny Wright was pulling out of a parking garage near City Hall after a presumably long day of tending to government matters. Sheriff Bill Watson, going to City Hall on an unrelated business, sees the mayor's expired tags on his car and goes to issue a citation. The mayor refuses to stop and exits the parking structure. It is unclear if he had to stop at the gate to swipe his parking pass or something like that. Sheriff Watson then proceeds to chase him through the downtown area of Portsmouth. Several police units joined in the pursuit before the mayor is stopped. Once stopped and asked about license and registration, Mayor Wright wanted nothing to do with the matter, saying, Sheriff, get away from me. Well, no one runs from the law, Mr. Mayor. After the matter, Sheriff Watson seemed dumbfounded describing the situation. He told me to get away from him. Really? He's going to jail. He was on the phone calling the police chief trying to do something about me stopping him. Mayor Wright still got that citation from the sheriff, but Sheriff Watson chose not to charge him with evasion. He's got to fall under the same law as any other citizen, Watson said. Boy, that's a good one, huh? Are you ready for a fun evening of guns and entertainment for the benefit of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation? Come in real quick now is the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation dinner. This year's annual dinner is Saturday, January 30th, 5 p.m. at Kerr McGee Center. That's just a couple, less than two weeks from now. Pre-sale tickets can be purchased and is encouraged. If you want to attend this event, purchase your tickets now. Contact Gavin Swanson, 760-589-4573, or email him at rc.rmef.tickets at gmail.com. Now in case of Jim's continuous effort to provide news and information you've asked for, here are today's gas prices for Ridgecrest and some surrounding areas. Well, since my report on Monday, gas prices everywhere has shown another drop. Local prices dropped another four cents per gallon. And Ridgecrest has the lowest prices in all the areas we are monitoring. As of this morning, Ridgecrest is ranging from 263 to 309. Lancaster from 273 to 305. The LA Valley area 269 to 289. And the Bishop area 282 to 293. We have two stations at the 263 amount. Tune in Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for updates. We at KZGN always suggest you shop locally to support our local economy. Remember, when you pay sales tax out of town, you're helping those cities pave their streets instead of here. Thanks for staying with us. Let's go to Lane for the weather. Thank you, Tom. The National Weather Service forecasters are monitoring the possibility of a major winter storm affecting the northeast later this week, including the possibility of heavy snow for the urban corridor extending from Washington, D.C. to New York and Boston Friday into Sunday. Based on the anticipated storm track, as much as one to two feet of snow is possible near and northwest of I-95. Coastal flooding is also likely. 
Temperatures across the nation. Carolina's at 35, Georgia at 43, Arkansas at 35, Northern Texas at 51, Arizona at 63, and Los Angeles at 64. And for us locally, tonight, mostly clear with a low around 38, south-southwest wind 5 miles per hour. Thursday, mostly sunny with a high near 61, south-southwest wind 5 miles per hour. Thursday night, partly cloudy with a low around 40, east-southeast wind 5 miles per hour. Friday, mostly sunny with a high near 62, south wind 5 miles per hour. Friday night, partly cloudy with a low around 43, South wind 5 to 10 miles per hour. And Saturday, mostly sunny with a high near 59. Southwest wind 5 to 10 miles per hour with gusts of size 15. And that is your forecast for the IWV. Now back to Tom. So that's some news for today. All the KZGN TV know you have a choice in what you watch for your news. We all thank you for choosing KZGN TV, Ridgecrest's only locally owned community TV station. Now stay tuned for Ridgecrest Talk coming up next. <laughs> 